And I'd say, well, I want to get rid of them because there are other ways of getting jobs. No, if you get rid of the capitalists, we'll all, we'll all, we'll all, you know, I mean, well, my mother, you know. <laughs> I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've had some of those arguments, I, you know, it's, 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 it's impossible, it's impossible. Anyway, so, so the, the theory was, but why would capital invest in low profit production? So they started to invest in other things. They started to invest in asset markets. They started to create new markets where they could make money out of money. And asset markets are different from ordinary markets because asset markets don't clear in any ordinary sense. I mean, the, the market for automobiles clears at, at some point or other, maybe. But an asset market is such that if I put money in the stock market, the stock market goes up and somebody says, hey, that looks a good bet, I'll put my money in the stock market. And then somebody says, yeah, I'll put my money in. And all of a sudden, all money's pouring into the stock market and stocks are going up and up and up. And, you know, people in the 1990s were saying, you know, well, the Dow's going to be at 35,000 very soon. And, and, and it's unlimited. But the same thing happens with property markets. The same thing happens with commodity futures. The same thing happens with all of these markets, and, and it's fascinating to look at the number of new markets that have been created since 1970s. I'm not only talking about the wave of privatization that turned you know, all of housing into a market, healthcare into a market, education into a market, all of those sorts of things. I'm not only talking about that. What we're talking about <coughs> is the development of new markets. For instance, the latest one they're really, really hot about is of course carbon trading. Already carbon trading in Europe is actually generating a lot of money for various people. But soon you could also create markets in derivatives, and you could create markets in insurance on derivatives, and then derivatives on insurance on derivatives on derivatives, and so you had a good time making loads and loads of money out of it. And what's more, that making money out of it has not stopped. About three weeks ago there came out the news that the leading hedge fund owners in the United States, five of them, uh, last year, in the midst of this crisis, got three billion dollars personal remuneration apiece. Now I thought it was obscene and, and absolutely ridiculous when leading hedge fund owners in 2004 got uh, something like 150 million people apiece. And you kind of go, you know, this, 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 I mean the money that's being made off this crisis by the upper classes is absolutely obscene. So, but it's being made mainly through the organization of these new markets. And that is what, where capital is going. Now, if capital is going into that, it's because it cannot find good markets to make things which people need and really want and need. You have to go and make this other market. Now, that raises then kind of question as to why that has been happening. And now here I want to suggest something, which is the general path of capital accumulation that Marx laid out I'm going to be very simplistic. You start with some money, you go into a market, you buy labor power, you buy means of production, you select a technological organizational mix, you put the labor to work in a labor process, you make a commodity, then you take it into the market and you sell it for money, the original money plus more money, the profit. So it's an expanding system. Then, because of certain requirements, a part of the money that was made gets recapitalized into new money, into new capital. And so the system expands. And it span expands at a compound rate. Historically, if you read Angus Madison or something like that, you'd see that the total volume of goods and services traded through the capitalist market, and obviously the data is difficult to believe too much when you're back in sort of 1820 or something like that, but since 1750 or 1820 or whatever you start, the compound rate of growth in the global economy has been around 2.25% per year. Now, there have been some decades where it hasn't grown at all and some where it's grown much faster. When you turn to the financial press and everything else, everybody sort of talks about a name and we've got a minimum compound rate is 3%. Below that, things are a little rough, it's getting sluggish and so on, of course zero is defined as a crisis. So there's an incredible, incredible concern about the growth rate. When are we going to get back on that 3% growth? Obama says 2011 we're going to be back on at least 3% growth. 
Gordon Brown said the same thing. Everybody is looking for that 3% growth. Now, what does 3% growth really mean? 3% growth means that you can, you can take 3% of the total product and reinvest it in extra economic activity, further economic activity. You can expand the system. Now, in 1970, that 3% growth meant you had to find new investment opportunities for something like $0.4 trillion. If you want to do it now, and I'm using constant dollars here, you have to think about $1.5 trillion of new investment opportunities. By 2030, you're going to be talking about $3 trillion of new investment opportunities. One of the things I want to suggest to you is that the story that's gone on since 1970 onwards has suggested it's harder and harder and harder to find profitable places to put the surplus, to put the 3%, and to find the 3% compound growth. Put in physical terms, you know, if you, if you were in 1750 and you're looking at what's going on in Manchester and Birmingham and a few other hot spots and said 3% compound growth on all of this, you kind of go, yeah, kind of the world's open, you know. Now you're talking about 3% compound growth on almost everything that's going on in China and East Asia, a lot of what's going on in South Asia, a lot of what's going on in what was the communist, part, communist bloc, a lot of, and of course Europe and North America, and much of Latin America and certain parts of Africa. I mean, you start to look at it and kind of say, 3% compound growth on all of that? What is that going to mean physically? What is it going to mean politically? What is it going to mean socially? And I'd like to suggest that actually we're at an inflection point in capitalist history where the question of compound great growth forever has to be seriously questioned, which suggests that there has to be some way to start to talk about who controls the surplus product and how is the surplus product going to be used? How is it going to be produced? In other words, the, the need to control growth becomes absolutely significant and absolutely essential for environmental reasons, social reasons, political reasons, you name it. Now, if we do not control growth, if we do, don't have some way of social control over surplus production and surplus utilization, if there is not some agreed upon me mechanism for that social control to be exercised. Then what we're going to find is a, a continuation of the system as it is, and you start to build some scenarios. I mentioned that we actually started in the 1970s with a labor problem, which was solved in a certain way to produce, in effect, an effective demand problem backed by a financial asset problem. What this brings us back to are the different limits and barriers that exist within the accumulation process. Now, my view of crisis theory under, under Marx is not that it has one single way of man being manifest. In fact, crises are manifest in radically different ways depending upon where the main blockage lies to the accumulation process. And my argument would be that capitalism never solves its crisis tendencies. It simply moves them around. It moves them around geographically and it moves them around from one kind of center of difficulty to another. So where are the centers of difficulty? I mentioned that business of beginning with money. One of the first things you need to do is to ensure that capital is in the right place in the right quantities at the right time. How is that done? It can only be done by the construction of a financial system that assembles all of those bits of surplus money around and assembles it in such a way that you can go build a railroad here, a port facility there, an airline here, a shopping mall somewhere else. And that takes a very sophisticated financial system. So financial innovation has gone on in the history of capitalism with almost each wave. I first hit this when I was working on Second Empire Paris. I mean, there was a big crisis of 1848. It was clear that there was a revolutionary kind of thing, and Napoleon III comes to power and says, my God, how are we going to do this? We've got to put capital and labor back to work. How are we going to do it? Well, bring in house money, we rebuild, rebuild Paris. That was one of the answers. This is the urban solution, if you like, 